a sacrifice seduced for the altar of your vanity. A jealous, hungry God craving praises of profanity. With bedroom dark and dine and a deep mouth stained with wine, it drinks. It's filled. It was your mother's, much your brother's, that agreed to feed you poison. This egregious lack of choice indeed seemed fit to join your voice in. With lies disguised as prizes of reason and wisdom, with briberies of finery to weaken any criticism. Can the fly invade the blossom that devours it? Hello and uh, welcome back. I know it's been a while, so appreciate you guys' patience. Um, we're going to get started with a one-shot Asamite meeting. Somewhere in the Middle East, perhaps in uh, modern Iran or the mountains of modern Jordan and Syria, among the craggy cliffs and in between uncharted deserts and oasis centers sits a legendary city of trade, laws, and knowledge. It is on no map and has no single name, but there is one marker that signifies you found it. The city surrounds a mountain of black basalt. The way there is guarded by more than men in distance. Legend has it that the only way to find it is to pass through gates with appropriate tribute. Not all the gates are physical, and the location never seems to be the same with two different people. On the way to the fortress city of Alamut, you guys have uh, met up. You have passed through the gates, and tomorrow night you will traverse the final distance to the hidden oasis that marks the entrance to the city. These vampires, the children of Hakim, on this journey tonight, number three, a number of mystical power. You have felt a pulse, a call through your blood that compelled you to come and arrive at this particular time. Sitting in the village, outside of the mountains. You recognize some of the agents here, watchers, judges, and servants alike. But decorum and rules prevent you from doing more than giving a knowing look to them. It is only to your fellow pilgrims back to the nest that you are allowed to speak. During the pilgrimage, you have met a few of your fellow children. One and all, you have noticed you all share a common trait. Each of you has studied the magic contained in your blood. So tonight, as you gather for a last look at the stars, uh, you have the opportunity to speak, or perhaps simply contemplate the trials that lay ahead. So, what do you guys do? How much do we know about each other? Nothing at all. Evan is going to proceed to uh, give everyone else that is give everyone else uh, the other that she, that he recognizes as uh, as a as the pilgrimage and not of our acknowledgement before approaching with a calm uh, look on his face. Brothers, what does uh, what does Urban look like? Irving has the look of a um, Persian man that looks to be in his mid-twenties. He has a, a, himself a, wearing a, robes, a robes that are very simple, very... There's no, there's no jewelry, there's no adornment, but they are clearly of fine make. They finally craft. Um, and most of them in dark colors and causes that to blend in well into the night. Ah, so, uh, Medi or uh, Stardust, how about you? How do you react to this?
Well, good evening, my brother. I am Astartes. Out of character, did he introduce himself? Uh, I don't know, uh, did he? <laughs> not, not his name, not yet. I am Astartes. Nice to meet you. May I know your name? Ah, uh, Astartes. I'm Erwin. Erwin Hashemi. Um, each of you roll your intelligence plus politics at difficulty six, or if you have clan lore, you can roll intelligence plus clan lore at difficulty four. And uh, Mehdi, do this as well? Yes, you may. The intelligence politics? Yes. Anyone who gets two or more successes realize you have heard the names before. Um, you've heard of Astartes as being out of Rome. Um, and you have heard of Medi as being um, out of, uh, most recently, uh, Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, and, of course, Irvin is... Uh, a out of a far eastern kingdom um, situated between the uh, somewhere on the far eastern reaches where Alexander the Great uh, nearly his, his campaign nearly stalled out can I deduce from their skin color how old they are if they're older than me or Am I the oldest one amongst them? Uh, perception plus awareness. Uh, you may modify this with aspects if you choose to use it. And that's one less difficulty, right? Correct. Right, so a start is you. Relax talking to these two newcomers open your senses um, and you feel that uh, Medi is younger than you are and uh, Irvin is a, about the same age It's, it's difficult to say 100% for certain, but he, about the same. I was looking for a rough marker. Um, another question. Is the calling a known fact amongst us, or only we uh, know it? The You feel instinctively that you can talk to the, each other. It's, it's an instinctive feel in your blood. Okay. Um... I have a question. Do you guys also feel the calling? Is this something that you felt before? Of course. The calling within your blood is what guides you all here, after all. Even someone that had spent so much time as far away from this place, Master Astartes. I understand you left from Rome, yes? Yes, that was a long time ago that I was here last. But I'm curious about this calling at the why now? Why at this moment? Out of nowhere. Do you guys know if there's something happening back here in the east? Because back in the west, I'm so far removed from the clan. I barely hear news of it. Well, I'm afraid I have no insights uh, into any possibilities on that front. I too was far from home uh, when I got the calling. But why we exactly? Because there was another of our clan with me back in Rome and he did not feel the calling. Why we? Only we? 
may I ask, are you in a particular political position back in your city? No. I do not deny that I hold a certain degree of influence within uh, my city of origin. Although, I do not know if that would be the reason as to why we are all called together. Surely the elders have some duty in mind for us to accomplish. They do not come as out of a sheer win. That is what I'm trying to figure out. Why we? Why not the general call if this is a clan assembly? Is there something else that you do that other members of our clan where you are does not do? Something that only we are able to do? I'll be honest, I have certain interests, but uh, it's not for me to say if that's the reason why uh, I myself am being uh, called. Interest as in the scholarly band? Scholarly kind of interest? You could say that. And is that the same for you? Mm -hmm. I agree with the best tutors that, to, that uh, are available within my region. So yes, I have acquired a uh, taste for knowledge. So all three of us are scholars. And is it safe to assume that, we're f that you're also from the Vizier caste? I traveled alongside the Vizius, learned under their tutelage. So, a, s a scholar warrior. I have to say, it's an art of meeting one. I've never met one before. <laughs> She is a uh, slight smile from zone of each face at the praise. <laughs> Feeling uh, stroking the flames of pride still within him that have not been smothered by his training. <laughs> you do me great honor with your words, Master Astartes. No, the honor's all mine. Um. So. If it's more on the scholarly band, I really, I really cannot think why we are called. So, do you guys have any, have any more information about why we might be called here? Any rumors you heard along the way? Perhaps she just called her less to do with us than with those that we are descendants of. Well, I suppose one thing we can be sure about is that whatever it is, I'm sure it's the for the best of the clan. And through us, and through the best of the clan, the best of our canines and mortals. Mm -hmm. Especially the mortals. Because I do not know how the situations are back in your home cities, but back in Rome, sometimes I wonder the future of our kind and the mortals if things keep going the way they're going. What do you mean? 
sometimes you see a blatant disrespect for the mortals. They treat them as even less than food. Expendables, things to be killed and tortured just for fun. Sometimes we do kill mortals, but there's always a reason behind the killing. Kin is not just done for the killing, just for the fun of it. And let's just say if the Dark Father was back in the West, he would have been very displeased with the actions of the Canines there. Yes, it is a unfortunate truth that since that the other clans, instead of smothering a wickedness amongst the ranks, prefer to foment it or even feed it. Although I suppose that if they are as disciplined as we are, our own task could not be required, our own position within our society not be required. But sometimes I wish there was more of our clan mates back in the West. Because out there we are so outnumbered that you may want to do something, but there's almost nothing that you can do. <laughs> Let's see what will this night will bring. Maybe oh. we will get the reinforcements back in the West that we need. The lands of the West are alien to us. You, previous status, are the vanguard of our clan. You are the one that must lay the groundwork. It is, a, it is as a honorable position as it is a challenging one. And challenging it has been. Costly also. But it is a necessary evil that I feel that must be done. I just wish sometimes I had more aid. But that's a matter for the elders to decide. I will just do the best that I can with the tools that I have. And I look at Maddie. Maddie, what is your scholarly pursuits, if I may ask? Uh, at this question, uh, Mehdi can be seen to be thoughtful for a, a brief moment. Well, let's just say it is of a more... Out of character, I'm not sure how to put this. Uh, <laughs> well, let's say I have a bit of a fascination with magic. And you see, a starters just shift a little bit forward. Magic, you see. Define magic. Is it the true magic that I've heard that some humans can wield? Or more of those in line with those inherent in our blood? Well, to be honest, a little bit of both, actually. I knew there was something a little different about uh, my blood, uh, hence the fascination that began to drive me towards learning what it was. And I look... Sorry, go ahead. I look at... PSP, what is your name again? Right now? Right now. Irvin. I look at Irvin. Is that the same for you? you find something particular or different in your blood that only you can do? My blood comes from a noble lineage, but 
I believe that everything that I can do is something that others can do, given enough practice and encouragement. <laughs> At least I have all else that share our blood, that share our calling. Because just like Mary has said, I also find myself particularly called to the arts of blood sorcery. Irvin, is that something that you can do also? As I said, I spent some time traveling under the tutelage of uh, the viziers and under the tutelage of Oshogin himself. So, that's that's the thing that binds us all three together. Our use and knowledge of blood magic. So, that may be one of the reasons why we are called here. Why only we can feel the calling. You think they wish to test us? Test us, judge us. I do not know, because the last time I was here, I was just but a child sent on my first mission to Rome, so it's been a couple of centuries since I last spoke with my sire. I hope he still resides here, but I'm not so sure. You spend the rest of the night talking... Um speculating uh, dreaming perhaps of uh, what fate may await you tomorrow before you head to your protected shelters you rise the next evening refresh yourselves and head out there is a small animal train on which you all arrived and a man steps forward he looks to be the same as any other man in this region uh, but he does a bow to you, a short bow with his hand to his uh, forehead, and introduces himself as your guide, uh, and mounts onto his uh, own donkey, and prepares to guide you all into the craggy rocks, uh, the maze of caverns uh, that awaits you. I assume you guys all follow. Yes. Correct. In, indeed. Uh, he leads you in. The caverns rise around you, but you still can see the open sky for the most part. Uh, he very carefully and slowly leads you through the maze of, of twists and turns and, and dead ends. And you know you're coming close when the moon becomes blotted out by the great fortress and castle and sanctuary known as the Eagle's Nest, rising high into the sky above you. Before you stands great black gates of the underground entrance. You know that there are watchers, canine ghoul and less corporeal creatures that guard this gate. They open before you on soundless hinges, granting you access. Uh... Inside the cavern, there are a few torches burning. A young vampire uh, who is uh, on his first assignment, a, a vizier in training, uh, awaits you. And he goes to uh, guide you to your... Uh, he picks out a particular ghoul who's standing there. Uh, Kareem, uh, describe yourself, please. Kareem, in appearance, is fairly plain um he his uh attire is fairly well kept but he's neither particularly handsome nor ugly um it, his demeanor it very much conveys a sense of polite obedience as would be expected as a servant with it, it's strange he perhaps at times gives an impression that he seems a little spaced out but the way he moves also makes clear that he's more alert than he might appear. If that makes sense. Um, 
beyond that, it's hard to get a... He's not really the kind of person who gives an Im a strong impression of who they are as soon as you see them, you know? Right. The, uh, the young vizier uh, points at you and says, uh, You, uh, stop what you're doing. Uh, go escort our visitors to their chambers. Um, Kareem nods. Um, if he's expected to give a yes, sir, then he will. Um, and um, approaches. Um, this way, please, sirs. And, uh, yeah, he leads you off to, uh, appropriate quarters, um. So, I want all three of you guys to roll your perception plus your, not a, yeah, your perception plus your empathy. Alright. The start us with three successes. He is indeed breathing. Um, and uh, he is, by all appearances, everything that uh, he is assumed to be. Uh, Medi with four. The only other detail you pick up on is that he seems nervous. Uh, perhaps he's just scared of screwing up and, you know, three of uh, children of Hakeem who could very easily uh, kill him. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, he's, he's as nervous as any other ghoul that you have seen around here over the years. So he seems pretty new, is I, I guess what you're, what we're getting at here. He's very scared of making a mistake. All right, all three of you are taken to chambers. Uh, nothing funny happens. They're pretty sparse. Uh, a single bed up off of the uh, rock a uh, small table to serve as a desk a couple of candles uh, you are left with a lit candle as well so you have a little bit of light inside the cavern um, Irvin when you sit down at the desk it rocks a little bit and your hands slip under and stuffed into a crack where there's a seam in the wood, there's the barest feel of a note for you. And you pull it out, um, and it's a note in a hidden cipher. Uh, and the cipher tells you that Isim thrice blessed wishes to speak with you. Does it say the location? Uh, it does not. It says, "Come." It basically says, "Come speak with me." And do I would he know where to find him? Uh, typically, being a one of he likes to spend time looking at the stars. That's everyone knows that. He's then going to proceed to make a visit to the higher levels. This would be a good view of the stars. Yep. Uh, indeed it does. You make your way through the halls, up and up and up. The stairs and the cliffs. You pass your familiar training grounds on which you've spent many a year learning the blade and uh, how to punch and kick and throw. You pass the uh, halls of philosophy where warriors recite the creeds of loyalty and learn the road of blood. And eventually you emerge onto a balcony that overlooks the city and uh, has a clear and un unobstructed view onto the sky. Izim is a, he's a small man with a stocky build. His skin is as black as night. And for what you can see of it, every square inch of his body is covered with tattoos. In prehistoric Mesopotamian cuneiform, antiquated Arabic script, hieroglyphs, sigils of various languages. He has only a pair of sandals and some sort of robe that stops at his waist. His upper torso is bare, and he has a pair of knives 
um, sheaths at the small of his back. He stands with his hands behind his back, his head tilted, looking up at the stars. Uh, it's a, a pose exquisitely familiar to those that know him. And he looks at you, and when his eyes meet yours, you're reminded he has. You're looking at someone who has been awake for more than 4,000 years. Would um, Medhi recognize any of the hieroglyphs on him? Probably. If Medhi was there. Oh. Uh, they, are, <laughs> they are prayers for the most part. Prayers to various gods, uh, forgotten and current, um, spells of protection, things like that. And uh, Owen gives the uh, polite, polite, no, uh, bow, polite nod, uh, lowering himself uh, respectfully. Beautiful night, is it not? He turns his head and, and looks back at the sky. And he addresses you in the language of Alamut, which you all speak. He says, Tell me, Hashimi. Think back to your lessons. For what reason were the judges established? To keep order within the children of Cain. To ensure that following of the rules and laws that govern our society and ensure of the continued survival and prosperity of it. And how do you live this path? By watching over the Canaanites, by p making sure that uh, no, the uh, non are committing excesses, that non are breaking the sacred rules, and by punishing the ones that do. Can you tell me the sacred rules? Um. I imagine what would be the sacred rules I would he, I imagine he would know yes. Well when you when you hesitate Azim he seems to expect it. And he says it's it's as I thought. Everywhere, everyone I speak to they interpret it differently. The viziers from region one region believe one thing, and the viziers from the south believe another, and from the north another. If we are judge and executioner, why do they call us warriors? Because the guilty do not accept the punishment that our fight. And so our order is required to judge and to educate the guilty. Tell me, is it the job of the headsman to fight a war? No. Well, then why are we known as warriors and not executioners? I have never given that much thought. He just stands and stares at the sky for several long moments. The breeze bring in the smell of clean desert, dry air, sometimes the call of a night bird. And he says, it seems to me that the purpose of a warrior is to eliminate enemies, 
not to sit in judgment of legality. Think. Have you been used to eliminate enemies? Autos that are guilty are all enemies. Autos that, we, that I have executed are all enemies. So yes. In your time, among humans, among us, do you not see, have you seen that warriors rise to the top? They must be commanders, guide their soldiers, in many cases assume governance. Have you seen that? Yes. He stops looking at the sky and turns back to look at you. He says, this is a time of change. The sorcerers among us, ever helpful allies and powerful friends, have been asked to join us in formality. No longer a vizier or a warrior, they will be known as the sorcerer caste. And when that happens, when they bleed our strength to make it their own, what happens to us? What happens to the warrior caste? Becomes needless. He nods his head, just so. They weaken us. You think that they are planning to acquire more control of the clan at all expense? He doesn't smile or react, he just stares. Tonight, tomorrow night, a week from now, they will call you, they will question you, and they will ask you a question. Will you be a sorcerer? There are none who will force you, but they will tempt you with power and knowledge. And he just looks into your eyes to see if you understand what he's asking you to do. What you are suggesting? Is a coup. You are suggesting to overthrow the sorcerers before they can carry out their plans. Yes? They are not so formalized yet. They must be weakened before they are ever obtain such abilities. A wall within Alamut, within the clan, could devastate it. And again he nods. Just so. You see my fear. So it's best to take them out before they have the mass enough power to make this a wall. Yes, I can understand your reasoning. Kill them not. Just prevent them from... Becoming strong. You'd not be telling me this if you did not already had a plan on how to achieve that, would you? The choice is yours. You can simply refuse to add your strength to theirs. That's one way. Alternatively, you could become a sorcerer. But remember where your true loyalties lie. My loyalty lies to the clan, to Oshogi, to Hakim. And if they were to dictate that all warriors must die? Then I would gather wood for the bonfire. He just nods and goes back to looking at the sky. Clearly, he has received the answers he was looking for. What about yourself? 
want they come to you the proposal having someone like you among the ranks of the sources would surely benefit them if I'm out and having me are you going to deny them are you going to reject the offer the promises he doesn't answer you he just stares at the sky for however long it takes for you to realize he's not going to answer that <laughs> He gives the young art of understanding at his silence before stepping back and leaving. Meanwhile, a spirit coalesces inside the room of Astartus. It seems to be made of dust and light, sparkles and swirls. The two bright points of its eyes focus on you, Astartus, and a voice out of the dust speaks to you. al Ashrad summons you to his study. Which is funny, because al Ashrad, powerful though he may be, is yet immortal, and he dares to summon a child of Hakim. Given that Astartes has a respect for Al Alashat as a wizard, as a sorcerer, he might be a little bit humble at the moment, given his experience back, back in Rome. He will overlook this perceived transgression and go to Al Ashrat to see what, what does you want at this moment um, the moment Astartes uh, steps outside his door uh, opens the door and uh, you know, walks out uh, Karim who's sort of um, in a corner of the corridor right now uh, seems to be looking over a sketch of some kind looks up oh uh, did you need anything I believe I've been summoned. Oh, oh. Uh, who who by? Perhaps I can... Uh, I don't mean to presume, I was just wondering if perhaps I could um, uh, show you the way, to, uh, the fastest way to them. Tell me, has al Ashrat's quarters has changed in these past couple of years, or is it the same as a few centuries ago? Um, out of character, would I have knowledge of that? You know where it's at. You haven't been there, but you know where it's at. Alright. Uh, I'll describe, uh, the, uh, way. I've never been there myself, but, uh... If you wish, I could... If you wish, I could, uh, show you along, but I do not mean to presume. He thinks for a moment, if al Ashat summoned him with a spirit, maybe he does not want to be followed or heard. I believe that will not be necessary. I take it Karim has explained to him, explained to him where al Ashat's quarter is, so Astaris can go there on his own because he remembers the layout a little bit of this place. Maybe you can see if Maddie needs your help with anything. But thank you for the offer. Um, Astartes, roll your... Uh, intelligence plus ledger domain. No, wits plus ledger domain. You're, you're drawing on memories. It, things have changed a little bit. My weakest oh. rule. <laughs> ah, okay. It takes you a little bit. Um, you get lost once or twice. You take a wrong turn. Uh, it would have been faster with the guide, but you do eventually find your way there. Um, you go to knock on the door to the study, and eyes boink, blink open on the door. It's brass, and these brass eyeballs turn to look at you, see who it is, and then the door opens on its own. Good evening, Master Alashat. 
sorry for the delay, but I believe you do not want me to be followed, so I get I got a little bit lost finding the way here on my own. Um, he gestures you to come inside. You enter the study. You see it crowded with scrolls, paintings, and artifacts. Uh, the tables are covered in uh, jars and vials. Flames burn from thin air uh, under glass and uh, bronze bowls. They send vile smells and colored smoke uh, into the air. On the floor, there are ritual circles and languages unknown to earthly tongues. There are three figures standing inside the study. Um, one second. All right. The first one you see is the golden-haired, fair-skinned, blue-eyed form of Alajrod himself. He's a powerfully built man, radiates knowledge and life. Um, second, you see your sire, uh, Tigerius. And lastly is a small figure, the size of a child, but horrifying in appearance. It wears white robes with thin sandals, and underneath the thin white cloth, the form is burnt and cracked. Bone appears in places under the skin. Uh, it has no eyes, no tongue, no hair. Uh, and what remains of its skin is black char. Yet you know you have seen it speak, you know it hears, and it understands. Urshalgi sees all that goes on around it. I bow immediately. Please forgive me, my elders. I didn't know you were present. The three of them make no move to return your gesture or even, or even ask you to rise. Alajrod does not invite you to sit. There are, in fact, no chairs, no cushions, and nothing on that would on the floor that might impede uh, the ritual circles. Alajrod wanders over to one of the stands that has uh, some of the leather bundles on it and just kind of lets his hand linger on it. He says, uh, <clears throat> Astartist Abdenana, why do you study magic? It is to find the mysteries of the world, to grow more powerful in understanding in the powers and ways to help the clan as a whole by applying that knowledge. And as a way of combating those enemies that cannot be combating, combated in normal means, those that cannot be touched, as a way to pass judgment, not so openly when you cannot do it publicly. Ultimately, as a way to further my duties as a child of Hakim and honoring the Dark Father with my actions. All right, uh, this is not directed at you, so don't worry about what this rolls for. All right. Um, Alajrod and uh, Tajirius uh, are both staring at you. And uh, Tajirius speaks up. He says, uh, 
There is to be a new case at the direction of Hakim. May he sit forever in our judgment. There is to be a case of sorcerers to seek out hidden knowledge, among other duties. I have long known that you desired to plumb the secrets of our of blood, to learn all of the ways in which it would apply. You have the knowledge, but do you have the will and the temperament? Do you have the grit and the power to see a mystery through to its end? And they kind of stare at you. I look at him with resolved eyes. Yes, I do, mister. I keep well, looking at him, stare in the eyes. Let's test that. What happened to Golzar? He was... I believe tricked into being found guilty of a crime from my investigations there because he did not want to take a side of the politics in Rome and somebody found him a perfect scapegoat for the machinations. And when it all came to light and the prince the prince there just wanted to execute him without giving him a proper trial but it, there was nothing that I could have done there to prove his innocence there was no way for me to f actually find and no time for me to find evidence it was like it was all orchestrated from the start Elizrod says, We have exchanged correspondence. What about the vision? Has this given you nothing to go on at all? I believe there was a traitor amongst our contacts at a time. Given the nature of the vision, I believe it was more of a western clan given the nature of the serpent I believe it was not one of the children of Seth but given Seth's affiliation with darkness and serpents I believe it might be another clan linked to the darkness I'm not so sure but back there, it's very difficult to conduct research on your own without drawing eyes of those above you. And at that, at this moment, I believe if I go looking for answers about deeper answers, I may draw the eyes of those that condemned my brother. Why they condemned him? Still at this moment, I'm not 100% sure. But if I, if the clan lose me, they lose a foothold there in Rome. So I believe at this moment, I would better serve the clan. Sticking there. Stay in Rome. Staying alive. Keeping an ear. See what is happening. Than to go follow this only lead that may lead to my destruction. And leave the clan without somebody to represent them there. Without somebody that truly sees Rome for what it is. And yet you have made partnerships, have you not? Have you not utilized them in your own investigation? Yes, I have. And they have found what? When those that I travel with, I do not trust them completely to divulge everything about my about the clan, about my investigations. 
but those that I seek outside from my coterie. It's beginning to point in a general direction that I will find the culprit. It may take me 500 years, but the culprit will be dealt with. I have to just take my time one step at a time, one short step at a time until I find who is responsible for this. I cannot move too hastily because then everything is for naught and his death has been in vain. I have to take just one little step at a time. And yet, the longer you delay, the more deaths these canines might range. The more unwanted destruction might be might happen at their whims, and the more powerful they grow and more difficult to kill. But in the same time, I would have also grown stronger, wiser, and may have found ways to kill them. And the more powerful they are, the harder they fall. The clearer the message will come across for when they actually fall. That is not why not to cross a child of Hakim. And what Patience steps are you taking? What steps are you taking to make this come about? What groundwork are you laying? Albeit ever so carefully. I'm beginning the first steps to creating an information network, one that cannot be traced back to the ch the children of Hakim, one that can be trusted, and a put potential recruitment for the children from the very Romans themselves. But it's going to take a while for me to build that, to foster the trust. Because back in Rome, I'm underestimated most of the time. I'm seen as a child. So, I'm using that to my advantage at this moment. Maybe they see me as somebody harmless. Yes, I am the Castellan there, but I play my role as unbiased, childlike over there that is just think that I'm goofing around most of the times over there. But I have something in mind to start building over there and strengthen the the authority of the clan over there, little by little. I'm in it for the long game. Let's talk about that. What cancers have you cut from Roman society? Over there, I have not killed. I have not judged anyone over there. I found them guilty and removed them. But I am compiling evidence, judging them, see who is worthy or not. Who is who is found wanting in the eyes of our father. And so far, I have not been impressed over there. There are so few that are worthy of their blood over there. But over there, we are weak. Only me, myself, and another one isn't enough to do our duties without being destroyed over and rendered useless to the clan. And so I'm doing. Who among them is worthy? If there are so few, give us names. Who is worthy? There is this Fentru that I've been talking to. She's a follower of the road of humanity. She is one that I found worthy. Who else? I won't even, I won't even talk about the prince because. I've tried to understand his way of thinking, but the more I study it, the more I see that it's going to only lead to destruction. All, most of the elders over there 
are not worthy of their blood. Alexander, at this moment, he seems honorable enough. There's a new Toreador, but that may be due to her age, that she's still new to the night. But, but for the rest, I'm not so sure because they all treat humans as as less than food, as something entertainment to be slaughtered. And sometimes I had to do things that I'm not proud of to getting close to them. I had to let humans suffer and die just so I can gain their confidence. But I'm not proud of that, what I had to do. Even the Cappadocians over there sometimes sacrifice humans just for knowledge. And I believe that's not a way to go. So as you see, of all the canines that I've met there in Rome, I only have three names of those worthy. So the situation back in Rome is terrible. You said three names, but you yet only told us one. You said out. You said Alexander. Maybe. Maybe. This new Toreador. Flavia. Maybe. Flavia. Flavia. She is, but she's that could be due to being new to the night. So being human, her compassion for the humans, it's natural to her. We have to see maybe in a hundred years if it's, if it's still the same. And out of character, what's the um the Ventus name again? The Julian Tasia. Yes. Julian Anastasia, that I can assure you. Um, Alajrod makes a gesture with his hand, and one of the leather um, bags opens up, and paper drifts across the uh, uh, space and settles in his hand. And begins slipping through it. In his notes, Golzar Shadi speaks highly of several other uh, canines that he has mentioned. There are salubri. There are there not. There are salubri there, but my duties has not bring me to come across them over there. This, this medicus, Gregory. How about him? You have spent no time amongst the sick. Uh, at his temple, the temple of uh, Escapulus? I'm afraid not. Yet, his former master was uh, once a member of the same coterie, uh, which you have uh, partnered up with. You have done no investigating on any of their uh, former associates? I'm, st I'm still gaining their trust. Get, getting them to trust me completely. I believe my last mission, as you call it, with them, I finally reached the level of trust that I can start asking questions. Because I've helped, I've, I've helped them traverse a dangerous situation, helped them revive one of their own. So I believe now I've gained the necessary trust of them that I can start asking questions without sounding suspicious. How about this Alethia? Golzar, his notes also speak quite highly of her. They say that she is honorable uh, in actions and words. He is honorable in actions and words, but does that same honor extend to how she treats humans? According I to cannot... Gozar's notes, yes. What what have you to say? I have spoken with her in private, but our discussions have led me to believe that yes, she is honorable, she's a woman of her word, but I have to see her interacting with humans. I have to see her how she 
views humanity and have not spoken to her more in that setting. I believe, if my memory recalls, she had a little bit of rivalry with Kolsar. That is when I went to speak with her to find out more a little bit, to gain a little bit of trust so I can find out more about that rivalry. What was it about? So I've spoken to her, but I've not really developed a relationship with her. So I can feel like I can properly judge her words. But she is honorable. But how far that honor extends, I'm not so sure. He uh, finds another name. There is a Lysander, a name we have heard here at the Eagle's Nest. His notes speak of him as being harsh, brutal even. But honorable. Lysander, I had the honor of speaking to him a few times when I was still new to Rome. Yes, he's, he is honorable, but he's a warrior. And I dare say, though he values his humans because they are warriors. I'm not so sure if he values other humans. He valued the lives of humans. He valued them because they are useful to him. That's the way I see him. As long as you're useful to him, he will value you. But I believe the moment that the mortal is not useful to him, he will just kill them. I believe he can wholeheartedly kill a whole village just because they displeased him or they are in their way, in his way. He has the warrior honor, but he is a warrior true and true. His way is the only way that counts. That's the vibe that I got of him. Do not warriors sometimes have to act harshly in the sometimes, face of their duties? Sometimes they do. So does he kill wantonly? Does he abuse the laws of the second city? He does not abuse the laws, but... I believe if bloodshed can be averted, it has to. Bloodshed is your last recourse, as a warrior, as a scholar, because bloodshed most of the times doesn't lead to anything good. It's just he to hurt and suffering on both sides. Sometimes it's the only way. But I believe Lysander, for him, that's the only way. And sometimes bloodshed can be averted. He, spe he uh, flips through the notes. How about this, this Bester? This Toreador. Again, another name that is known well to us. What are your impressions? You see him think long and hard because he knows Bester is an elder, so... He has to be very careful with what he says about him. Out of character, the only time I've seen him it was... Have I interacted yeah. with him in the court? No. It, it's totally fair to say that you have... Your paths haven't crossed. That's, that's a very fair statement. Yeah. Though I've seen him in Rome, I've, we haven't crossed our paths. We haven't spoken with, with each other. So I will reserve my judgment of him. How about Crethius, scion and child of Mithras? A scholar, a learned one. He, if I believe, do I know that he's also a blood sorcerer? Yes, you do. Yeah. He's also one that practiced the arts of sorcery. So, you could say he's also a scholar by nature. 
Ed, so, tell me, yeah. if he offered you tutelage, would you accept it? If he offered me, I would think long and hard because why is he offering me tutelage in, in blood sorcery? What is it that he wants out of me in return for it? It's not something that I will take lightly. Because the, because the origin of blood sorcery can go wrong in it very easily. What's the source of his knowledge of blood sorcery? That. So, while blood sorcery is powerful, you have to be careful. What's the origin? What's the source? What had you had to bargain to get it? And some people who bar use blood sorcery, as you guys are aware, are of the treacherous kind. Are you accusing him of... No, I'm not accusing anybody. That's what I'm telling. I cannot pass judgment if I do not know 100%. I reserve my judgment of him. You asked me if I would accept tutelage from him. I said I would think long and hard about it. Because I do not know what he wants from me in return. How about this Trifosa? The seer. Ah, uh, the Malkavian. I believe my, my past is not crossed with her in this storyline yet. Right? Chris, out of character? You've met her several times. As a stardust? Oh, yes. You've been at the assembly where she, she skinned herself. No, I was not. That was in... Yeah, you, your character was there. <laughs> um, uh, you, okay. you have talked to her. You haven't fought her, but you have talked to her. Yeah. I believe... Okay, then it's safe for me to assume that I believe her visions are correct, but sometimes she... As it is with most visions, it can be interpreted differently, but I believe it is wise to pay attention to what she says when she says she's having a vision, because there might be something there that's better not overlooked. He shuffles through a few more. You can see he's considering whether to ask you about them or not. And he looked at Tigerius, and Tigerius says, So after several years, you have no answers, truly, what happened to Golzar. You are struggling to build partnerships. You are not getting much out of them, what you, what you have built. Your contacts in the city are lacking, to say the least. You have cut few, if any, of the cancer out of Roman society. I believe it's safe to say that under your watch, the children of Rome do not fear judgment. And you're right. The children of Rome... You are no longer Castellan of Rome. We will discuss and see if you will return a sorcerer or not. You are dismissed.
Uh, hopefully you guys can still hear me and something didn't happen. Uh, yes. Hello, I'm back. Okay. Still here. All right. Yeah, I think a Stardust might have dropped for a second. Ah. Yeah, so, a Stardust has been dismissed. Um, hold on a second. A short time later, uh, Mehdi, a spirit appears to you in similar fashion. Ah, uh, shit. Oh, yeah, that really sucks. Um, well, let's hold off on that because we're about to do something else. Um, Kareem, very carefully look over your character sheet. As you have been listening at the door to Alice Rod's study, you hear you are dismissed and you turn to go and you trip and face plant right on the stone, right outside. There's a big scrape. And you get up and your nose is dripping a little bit of blood onto the floor. Oh, fuck. You have a half second to do something and you can go ahead and type out to me what that is or you can just say it. And I'll just tell you uh -huh. what you have to do. Um... Hold on, let me just. As you're as you are deciding what to do, you real you realize the door is opening up behind you. So. Um. Quickly, um, quickly, um, sh d dashing over to a shallowed portion, he hugs he hugs the wall essentially, and I am going to make a certain roll. Okay. Uh, to try and recover this. Yep. Uh, so this should be... I just need to know which... You can type it out to me. Which power and level... Which power are you using and, and how much of a power are you doing? Um, message to you. The, okay, uh, I see it. Yep. That's, uh, excellent. I believe you have that. Let's see. Yep. That, that's not it. That, uh, oh. Oh. Okay, uh, let me check something really quick so I can let you know how bad this is going to be. I believe that's a really good for you, actually, so. Yep, yeah. yep, yep, oh, um, roll as normal. Okay, I'm back. It appears that everything's working perfectly. Um, let me just okay. uh, quickly calculate. Right. So yeah, um, Astartes, uh, you were you were dismissed. Uh, I, what was the last thing you heard? The last thing I heard, well, I was explaining how the children back in Rome forgot about Hakim and how the elders are basically hiding the knowledge of what we are able to do over there. What our role is. Right. Um, yeah. So. Uh, Tigerius looked at you and basically said, it's clear to me that you have uh, it's clear to me that you have failed as Castellan. You are no longer Castellan and they will decide if you return to Rome as a sorcerer or not, or if you are going to be staying here. 
Okay, strangely, you will see when he hears that he has been relieved of his role as Castellan, he was, it's almost as if a weight had been lifted off his shoulders. I will accept right. your judgment, and he, you will leave. As, as, you, as you turn to go, the door pops open by itself, and you hear a thud! Fuck, that hurt! Shit! And then a scramble, and the door whoop, flips wide. I need a perception plus alertness roll from you. Um, it's difficulty six, but you need seven successes on it. Can I use all specs? Um, yes, you can. So that makes difficulty five, but again, you still need seven successes. Not so sure if we could get that much, but let's see. Nope. Oh, right. Yeah, you hear this, fuck! And you look out the door, and just as you open the door, uh, you step out, there's several, um, a crew of several people that walk past uh, down the hallway, and whoever it was, you can't tell. I look suspicious in their general area. See if see if anybody looks back. If, if they don't, I walk to my chambers. Nope. It, it's whoever it was has got away clean. Or before I go, I touch the ground and want to use spirit touch on it. Okay. It's what's the diff? Uh, difficulties five. All right, it was definitely a man. Um, you, you, the vision that you get is is of a man with a, a beard. Um, he's crouched down. He's wearing plain plain clothes. Um, the kind of clothes you see everywhere in Alamed, unfortunately, the clothes are not of help here. Um, and you hear, from this perspective, the, you are dismissed, and then your Astartes' response, and then you turn to go, and that flash of pain as your nose meets stone, poof! Ah! Um, whoever you're looking for um, might have broken their nose on the stone. At the very least, it's blood. It's quite bloody. Okay. For the time being, I think I will go to my chambers, but keeping an eye out for people with bloody clothes or what appears to be a broken nose, something like that. Right. Moving on, about half an hour later, um, Mesdi, you get a very similar summons. A spirit appears out of thin air uh, from the dust and, and gathering light out of your candle. And it says to you that Alajrad summons you. Very calmly and casually, he'll uh, get up and proceed to follow the aberration. Uh, the aberration disappears. It appears, tells you you are summoned, and then is gone. Well, you know, following the summons, then, in that case. Um... You make your way out. I need a Wits plus Ledger Domain roll. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, four successes. You remember exactly where it is, and you walk directly to it. Uh, as you walk up, it, the you notice just outside the door, um, it looks like the stone has been very freshly scrubbed. You can actually smell a little bit of lye or something in the air. Um, once again, it's a brass door. As you go to knock, a pair of eyeballs pop open in the brass, turns to look at you, and uh, then the door just opens on its own and allows you to enter. Yeah, he does so. Green, your sire is there, along with the blonde haired, powerful figure of Alatrod, and the small, terrifying child figure of Urshulgi. Who, if you had known, if you had been in the previous meeting, you would see he has not moved at all. Not to shuffle, not to take a step, or anything. He is in the literally the exact same spot and has not moved. Now your sire, uh, Imram, is uh, there and he is as black and as dark as it seemed thrice blessed. He lacks the tattoos of that man. Um, his skin, though, his fingers in particular, are stained uh, with a substance uh, that is not of age, it is of ink. Um, he carries the scent of incense and beeswax on him. He has several pouches that he carries at all times. Uh, you happen to know from being uh, tutored by him on how to read and write that uh, quite often these contain chalk dust, chalk, um, pieces of charcoal, uh, dried ink that he will often mix with water or, or milk or his blood to get uh, to liquid. And, uh, he, uh, and sometimes grease and fat, fatty material. Just everything you might need for scholarship kind of things. Um, and yes, he's something of a hoarder. Um, he, he doesn't clean them out much. So, you uh, enter, the door shuts behind you. Alishrod uh, looks at you and says, I am Eddie. Pleasure for you to join us. A question for you. How did you first begin to learn blood magic? Well, I discovered uh, at a time uh, far after my embrace that my blood was I suppose a little bit different than most and so it uh, encouraged me to explore this and to learn all that I could about what it could offer And what has it offered? Well, thus far, it has offered me the ability to manipulate uh, my blood, or rather, the blood of Hakim for the good of the clan. I've also learnt that the power itself is not inherently mine. That as well has uh, encouraged me to study that end further. <clears throat> I 
I would like to see a demonstration of what you can do. Of course. Okay, now out of character. Love to have a think about which one would demonstrate exactly what she just oh exactly what he just described. I'm not sure if this one's going to impress them much, but um, I think he's going to call upon the commune with canine ritual. Level two. Okay. Who are you going to commune with? I think she'll attempt to commune directly with all sugar. Oh, whoever. Uh, is it? Is that... no, really? No, well, whoever's, whoever's in the room. Um, I th I think your sire might be a better option there. Yeah. Yeah. Cause admittedly, he wasn't my first choice, but out of character, well, I wasn't sure how far up I mean, trained to go. But a uh, uh, shogi would give points for courage. Uh, <laughs> you can say that at least. It'd be a good death. It would have mm. out of existence. <laughs> All yeah. right, level two ritual. Yeah. Uh, it's in the main book, right? Yeah, page 304. Ah, thank you. Uh, let me have a, another look at it. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Just want to double check. Commune with Kenai. By enacting this ritual, a caster may join minds with another Kenai speaking telepathically with her over any distance. You must meditate for 10 minutes over a physical token. Okay, so you sit down. You, you first off... Uh, give me a quick intelligence plus occult roll at uh, difficulty six. How's it? Uh, the diff three plus the level of the of the ritual. So it's diff six, but I need an intelligence occult roll, which is not the ritual. Right. Okay. So, so your ritual is going to be diff 5 to enact. Um, so the ritual itself, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hold up then. So I'll set up the initial roll differently then. Uh, where are we? Intelligence. Occult. Diff 6. Might leave the what do you call it? Yeah. Right. So you're looking about at the circles on the floor, and you realize the center, or one of the circles um, near the edge, is uh, cast in multiple layers of of mystic protection. It's a circle of protection for the occupant. Um, and if you're going to show your knowledge, well, a good way to do it would be to ask permission to use that circle of protection while you're doing it. Indeed. Mehdi probably knows this. <laughs> yeah, so I had you make the roll. Ah. So you are considering what to do and your eyes cast about and you see the circle and you're like, oh, hey follow proper channels let's see if I can use that and that's going to show uh, that at least I'm, I'm not some idiot just foundering in the in the deep deep waters of sorcery all right so he does approve you to go sit uh, in the circle of protection and you pull out uh, a flat stone that used to be owned by your sire. And you begin to mutter over it, meditate over it. And uh, 
cast all thoughts from your mind except envisioning the stone upon which your sire's face appears. So make your ritual roll. So, same roll, right? Just uh, yep, five. just diff five. Ah, yes. Um, what do you say? You feel the connection establish. Okay, out of character. Um, more than likely he would try to think of something that would impress upon them that he has indeed made connection and that his, his sire wouldn't just be saying something that he already knows. All right. Um, uh, give me a self-control roll. At difficulty six. Okay. Control. Alright, well, the, you refrain from doing the first thing which pops into your head, which is to tell an incredibly filthy joke that you just heard. Which would have been entirely inappropriate for the situation. Oh, absolutely. I'll be honest, sir, out of character, I've got no ideas. <laughs> okay, well, you say a passage of philosophy or something. Um, yeah. And... You're, when you say it out loud, your sire acknowledges that he's heard it because he... he explains that he has heard it as an echo. First he hears it in his head, then he heard it with his ears. It was an odd echo. Um, Alishrod nods, and you cut the ritual. Cut off contact. And he says, do they ask you? They say, you have spent much time in the mud and the dirt among those that have been known as impure, diseased even, those followers of the one who calls himself Set, those sometimes Nosferatu. If they were to offer to teach you their knowledge of sorcery, what, what would, how would you react? What would you say? Out of character initially, uh, Mehdi um, ref refrains from saying what first pops into his head um, and tries to prepare a more careful answer. But without pondering for too long, he replies, I would be very cautious. Of course, uh, the uh, oh, God, my brain's not working. I apologize. <laughs> um, of course, knowledge can be powerful and useful, but. I would be hesitant to, all power comes with a price. They would certainly want something in return, and I would be hesitant to allow any of our secrets to fall into the hands of other Cainites outside of the clan. If, however, they were to accept anything other than clan knowledge or clan power, then I would certainly consider it. Again, 
it could be very useful for the furthering of our clan. Matthew, and there have been many who walk the paths of that you have walked, that we have had doubts. Corrupted by the Ventru or drawn into the games of power. I find your caution, yet honesty, speak well of your character. Often, those that move amongst move with the path that you move become too cautious too hidden they they lose all perspective of who to trust we need explorers those not willing those not afraid to venture off the path and yet they must possess caution to know when they have gone too far or to know when they are being tricked I have seen and heard enough. And Urshalgi still does not move. They look to him, he doesn't move, they just look back at you and you've been dismissed. Etty obliges and uh, gives a very slight head nod and turns to leave. All right. The rest of the night is uneventful. You guys have leave to explore a good portion of uh, the Citadel. Uh, you are respected. Most of you are, are very close to Ancilla. So uh, there are very few areas that are off limits to you. You may go up out, outside and catch air. Walk amongst the herds that feed the Asimites. Perhaps you go and train with the young warriors uh, whatever the case may be you spend the rest of the night doing your own thing the next evening each of you are awoken by summons by from a ghoul uh, you are called immediately to the heart's blood of the clan He makes himself ready to the path to the heart's blood. Um, I presume this is just the embraced Asimites called over? Yes. Uh, Kareem, you are, in fact, one of the ghouls, though, that came to summon them and are among them taking them uh, to the area. Okay. Yeah, D will begin making his way. I'll follow. Um, Keeping an eye on Karim. You are each escorted deep, deep into the fortress. Down and down, deeper than you've ever gone before. None of you have been here. Finally, <clears throat> you stop. Alice Rod and several others are there. They, each of you, if you have aspects, roll your um, soul soul sight for me, please. Perception, empathy, diff eight. Hey. I really have bad luck with that power. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you do. Uh, the ghouls are dismissed. They turn around and leave. Diff eight. So it's diff eight with the or specs. I'm yes, guessing. it is a flat diff eight. And that's right, because it's read the soul. I believe I've never scored a high enough roll with this one. Oh, mine was even worse. 
Fuck, yeah, Met- Metty, you uh, uh, attempt to read, and your eyes become just... It's like you're in a darkened room, and somebody hits you with a pulsing flashlight real quick. It's like, oh, shit! Um, just painful for, for a half second. Uh, you drip a couple of tears of blood as you, you have to kind of blink them out of your eyes. Um, it's a couple of bloody tears drip down your cheeks. Um, oh, okay. So, yes, they meet you, and you're given a second to say something if you have something you need to say. I look at Maddie. Are you okay? Uh, as Maddie's just uh, wiping those streaks away, he's like, I'm fine. And I whispered, the time of judgment has come. Let's go face it. Indeed. Alajrod and a couple of the um, K Knights walk up to the door and they place their hands on it. And they begin to call out in a language you guys have not yet been taught. You see bloody symbols light up on the cavern doors and then it doesn't open it fades into insubstantiality and you are gestured to walk through the through the now incorporeal stone wall if he obliges yeah Yeah, go ahead is there anybody who who refuses i'll walk in first Irving, I walk in after him. You walk in, and even though there's no torches, there's light that glows from the walls. Lichen, perhaps. Perhaps it's just the magic of the chamber. At your feet is an enormous pool of blood. You can hear it. It's, it's so large, you can hear it lapping with gentle lap, lap, lap sounds. You can smell it. Th- incredibly thick. Uh, vitae. Alajrod steps forward and he says, Welcome to the heart's blood. Here, accumulates the very blood of Hakim. All that is given to him in tribute. That one day all who have partaken of him may be as of him. Uh, the one of the other uh, vampires reaches out with a cup and they scoop up three of the cups and they hand it to you and you notice that the blood that dripped the excess overflow drips onto the floor and then rolls like it's attracted as it gets sucked back into the pool it says drink of it and then follow me back for we have one more place to visit tonight and is there anybody who refuses to drink I say having takes the cup and brings it close to his lips he lets out a short prayer to Hakim before he starts drinking it I bring the cup to my lips and whisper before I drink it, as you will it, my dark father, and I drink it. Right? Mehdi will do something similar. 
what he knows is proper well proper but you know or whisper something in respect to Hakeem before drinking yeah so you all drink it and for a moment uh, you are it is pleasure and then it is all pain as it begins to burn through you as it goes down your throat into your stomach and it hurts it burns like fire um, and as you are distracted uh, with the pain of rebirth um, they dr come forward each of them grabs you as you as you sag and you are dragged out of the heart's blood and propped up in a, another chamber um, Kareem you are among several ghouls who as uh, uh, in about 20 minutes after this happens um, there's a sweep conducted and they're just grabbing people and you're one of them and you're taken to this chamber and you're pointed at a hookah and you're told smoke it Um, I, uh, I obey, trying to keep, trying to keep two different perceptions, uh, balanced in my mind right now. S so yeah, I smoke it, um. All right. Um, they begin to smoke it, and it is a fucking acid trip. Um, it's laced with powerful hallucinogenic drugs used by sorcerers to cast their minds and senses elsewhere. Um, Uh, finally, the burning is beginning to fade just a little bit, just enough you guys can concentrate. And you are taken to the room, and they tell you, each of you, grab one and feed on them. And when you, when you are, when you have fed, come back here, or the ritual will truly begin. I will grab one to start feeding. Right. Yeah, you you just grab same. one at random. You grab one at random. Yeah, it's just one at random. Except for Karim, because I'm suspicious of him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all of them look like they're on an opium high, just sort of sitting there, eyes wide open, drooling a little bit, like, oh. They're, they're obviously tripping balls right now. Kareem actually probably looks more out of it than most of the others. Um, assuming that there is nothing, no markings that will signify which one is for each one of them. Nope. Yeah, Just pick one. one. <laughs> um, you are taken to a ritual circle. Uh, each of you are placed inside of it. And the world begins to drift away. Your eyes close and they open. And you're in a dark cavern. There's people all around you. Other children of Hakim, you seem to instinctively understand that you are in the middle of a fight. This feels incredibly real. Um, if like if you were to slap yourself, you would actually feel the pain. You feel like you you are here, and whatever's happening here might actually happen to your body. It's how real this feels. You look around. There are you see several famous, powerful children. It seemed thrice blessed is there. Uh, Jamal, the eldest of the warriors, is there. Uh, you see several others as well. But there's also a number of humans and a number of ghouls there. And everybody's... The smell of fear is thick in the air. Uh, you can hear things approaching. 
Not, not the stamp of feet, but things coming through the caverns. And Jamal steps up and he shouts out, They can approach again! They approach again! And he starts shouting out orders to different companies and some people rush up to the front uh, with these small round shields. Obviously, they, they are of no modern maker construction. They appear ancient to your eyes. Um, what do you guys do? The three of you realize that you are in battle, in the thick of it, in full possession of your capabilities. Evan's going to join the fight. Uh, would he see a place that he would be most useful? I think, would, amongst the shield bearers, or would it be another unit that he more in line with his fighting abilities? Uh, what kind of weapons do you normally fight with? And say that they're having normally fights with dual swords. Right. So yeah, the shield bearers come up. They take first rank. You see spearmen and uh, swordsmen coming up right behind them. Uh, normally, you've 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 been in a few fights you, in battles. Normally, there's a lot more spearmen. You think that they're and and shields guys. You think their ranks have been thinned out considerably. Um, Astartes. You recognize immediately these men are no Roman infantry. There's no shield locking. Um, there's none of the Roman tactics that you would be familiar with. Um, these are obviously a bunch of guys who have gotten together and had a little bit of training and got thrown in the fight. Okay. Then I will... Is there any way somewhere high where I can get a view on the field? Um, you are in a dark uh, maze of caverns. You can actually see a couple of branches off to other directions. You have no idea where they go. Um, and you just hear echoes of approaching clicks and clacks, chitters and hisses, and yes, a few feet. Then I draw my knives. And if I see, do I spot any rank of ranged combatants? Uh, yeah, there are several archers um, and people who seem to have some sort of throwing knife and uh, some sling pe sling bearers, people getting slings ready and starting to, to whirl them a little bit. I approached them, ready to join the fight, but also prepared to use a movement of the mind to hinder opponents or stop opponents or whatever I can do to help guide the battle. Right. Uh, Mehdi? Yeah, well, I'm thinking um, even though he's not a warrior, he would certainly carry a weapon to defend himself. Um, I think he'd probably be a bladed weapon, either a big knife or a sword or something. Sure, absolutely. Um, and same as uh, Asadis, I think. Uh, be prepared to use whatever he has at his disposal as well in the form of uh, disciplines and rituals. Right. Um, Kareem, you consciousness has also been brought into the vision. You find that your mind is in the body of a simple soldier, uh, a stream of urine running down your leg. Uh, you're kind of holding a spear. It trembles in your hand, uh, in fear. You sit there and you wait, and it, the sounds gather, and they gather closer and closer. Everybody's, they, they prep, everybody's ready for the rush to come in. The first thing you see as it comes in is a man-sized scorpion. It claws appear around the curve and then the rest of the body kind of slithers around and you see the glistening chitin uh, on its back and a stinger that comes up dripping uh, with venom poison of some kind and then a the second one on the other side of the cavern and a third on the top wall on the top roof comes around uh, and then something about it it twists and there's a human face underneath it, screaming in agony. Uh, 
making in incomprehensible sounds of just pain and, and suffering. Uh, then behind them, uh, behind the three of those come several humans bearing shields similar to what uh, your ranks are, we are wielding. And then behind them, you see vampires. Pale, balding, hair is all stringy. There's just something about them that strikes you as mutated, almost. They're they're hideous, but but there's it's it's, it's metaphysical, not physical. And you hear you hear them shouts. They come! The battle joins, and people begin to scream and rush. And a lot of the screams are of fear. Uh, uh, Irving, as you are among the front ranks and the battle is joined, how do you react? What do you do? Um, first of all, would he be able to recognize the creatures as being creatures of the Tizimish or being creatures of the Balai or the this nature the, of the creatures? The Zemis, you've run across a few of them. The Zemis like pain. They pale in comparison to the horror that's in front of you. This is ball eye. This is ball eye corruption, not just Zemis fuckery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seeing that he's going to be joining the fight. Right. What's your first action? What do you do? His first action, um, there's the the key to the key to the bit that allows to enhance the blade with blood. Yes. Uh, yes, you can enhance your blade with blood. Yes, he's going to be doing that. All right, you had enough time to prep that actually, so it's ready. I believe you just have to make a you have to make a roll to see how effective no let's see in order to use power you must ingest it or give it to the bloodstream do, 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 do. and then you make a roll so nope you just lick the blood or whatever and put it on your weapon all right so it's ready he's going to proceed to then dive into the fighting and uh, the nearest creature he's going to uh why the ones that had the shield uh, attracting the attention, he's going to be trying to hit it through the sides using his celerity if necessary to um, join in the fighting and get the drop on the creature moving right. faster. You are significantly faster than the creature is. Um, it climbs up, uh, is, is, is actually on the wall itself, it's not on the floor. Um, and four of its of its legs are like anchoring it down on the on the wall, as a, a three or four of the of the fighters approach it, and its claws reach out, sap sap sap, and that that's, that that tail is like waving in their face, and uh, as um, one of them you know just desperately trying to block the tail, um, you whip in, give me a, a attack roll to a targeted attack, so it's gonna be difficulty eight. Um, to uh, cut off some of its legs, anchoring it to the wall. And in the it meantime, maybe... it's changing its target to oh. you. <laughs> I was just going to ask, um, pro like, would Medi have had a, the opportunity to cast something like Strength of the Earth to prep himself? Um, yes, you absolutely can, and you did have you had a, a couple of minutes to prep. All right, so okay. um, it that that stinger it sees you come and it sees the the knife come out and the the tail just whips at your head and you just kind of duck to the side real quick, and you actually feel a few drops of that poison land on you and, and it it itches. It's it's slimy and sticky at the same time, and uh, your knife whack jams up uh, into the a chink in the armor. Where the leg joins. Um, go ahead and make your poison effectiveness roll, which is going to be. You're using Scorpion's Touch, or are you using uh, Dagon's Call? 
Mm. <laughs> That's level three is scorpions. Level three is, yes. is Dagon. Out of irony, I'm going to say scorpion since they're fighting the scorpion. Excellent. Once ingested, the, the the target immediately rolls stamina plus four to two to Fenny. At the end of its next turn, loses the number of stamina points equal to the number of successes on the canine's willpower roll minus. So roll your willpower at difficulty six. Also, should I make the roll for strength of the earth? Um, yes, please, just to make sure you don't botch. <laughs> sure. Uh, to remind myself what it is. All right. That's right. All right, so the fighting is thick and furious. Um, Irving, your knife is wreaking havoc. You stab, jam, boom, you're cutting a leg off. Um, the tail is whipping, whipping. And a couple seconds after you stab it, it gets, it's like something just is like tired. Like it just hit a wall. The wall of, uh, you know, runners, as they run, just hit that wall and be like, I can't run anymore. And that's exactly what it is. It's like, and you see, it's almost like it's punch drunk and his legs begin to unattach from the wall and just kind of falls off on its back, exposing that, that tortured head, the face, and its belly. Uh, Medi, uh, you're up next. Um, Ir Irvine has uh, joined the fighting um, and is uh, being quite effective. As it turns out. Nice. All right. Uh, well, it's got four successes on the strength of the earth roll, so that means I can keep my bonus for was it four turns? I think. Right. At this at this point, mm -hmm. so I've put two into strength and one into stamina. X outstanding. Okay. Uh, as for what he's going to do next. Not sure how well this would go, but not sure if the the power of the elements would help here. Uh. Let's see what else I've got. Okay, so you said uh, it was uh, lying on the ground exposed at the moment? Yeah, but they're, they're, they're falling all over that one. So you're going to have to target something else. So either one of the other soldiers or one of the other scorpions. Okay. Well, obviously seeing that um, the creature's been taken care of, she'll turn a focus to the soldiers and try and el eliminate as many of them as, she, as, as he can. Okay. So he's just saying she. <laughs> no. You have free reign. What are you wanting to do? Uh, she's, uh, he's probably going to start with attacking whoever's closest. Okay. So you push your way through the ranks of defending soldiers to get up close and personal. Um, you can get within touching distance if you want and do what? I'm gathering as she gets uh, as he gets closer, he's probably going to notice their facial expressions and body language yeah. and everything like that. Uh, yes, hatred is is the operative word. Hatred and eagerness. The bloodlust is upon them, and they sense victory. You're losing. Okay. And of course, he'll be willing to do whatever he can for the clan. So he's just going to. I don't know if he just want to slash and uh, cut and slash wildly, but he do the best he can to, you know, strike. Okay. Uh, give yeah. me a dex melee roll then, since you're striking with your blade. Oh, 
right? Uh, you just reach out and you wound one of the uh, one of the attacking soldiers. He pulls back with a hiss, and you see the fangs in its mouth, and then the wound begins to heal almost instantly. Uh, Astartes, how do you join the fight? How wide is the gap from where they are coming? Uh, about about uh, seven or eight feet wide. So it's enough to fit three people across um, if they're if they crowd in two two with comfort. Okay. I'm gonna try to block that passage, make it wide enough for just one people to get through. So I'm gonna essentially what I'm gonna do is try to create a 300 effect of here, where our small group of warriors can hold out against their much larger group by yeah. making them come in small numbers. Yeah, they're they're actually they're so you're at a like a slightly wide a wide portion of the cavern and they're pouring through an opening in it. So yeah, yeah. If, if you can slow them down, that would help you guys out. I will go over there and use elemental form and turn into a giant boulder made of steel. Okay. Uh, as you run up and, and, and get there and, and you prep the power, um, uh, a stinger hits you, slams in your I shoulder. Boom! I have my Aegis with me. Okay. It that's will hit you with three successes. That I'm going to expand. Okay. Three. Um, the rest of you see there's a there's a flash, a push, and a medallion on his chest pulses. And the stinger, instead of hitting him, the, the medallion itself flips in the way somehow, and boing, and it bounces off. Um, that would have been a devastating strike, and you know it. Yeah. You, you assume the form of the boulder. Uh, make your roll for me. I have another idea for next turn. Okay. Yeah. You see Astartes runs up fearlessly. Um... His magic, whew, the medallion protects him from a devastating strike, and he and 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 he, he mutters a few words of magic, and you see from his feet he transforms into a roughly a stardust shaped column of metal. And he reaches his hands up to get him as high as he can, and and he goes colossus on you guys, and he is now a solid block of steel. And now looking at that power, just to make sure, see what the weakness is. Just want to make sure that you can or cannot be hurt in it while you're using it. You are remarkably impervious to harm, but take one level of unsuitable bashing damage each turn to form is disrupted in any significant way. Okay, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, so there are several creatures and people inside the cavern now that are getting fallen upon. Um, Astartes, you retain your senses and your discipline abilities with this. And for just a moment, you wish you could flinch as coruscating black and green energy erupts from the floor around you and wraps around this Astartes statue. You all see this. It tries to drag it out of the way and fails. And it just... Boom! And it hisses and whips, crackles. You can see it leaving burning marks on the metal, which once the uh, tendrils recede, the uh, marks fade, having done him uh, seemingly no harm. Uh, Kareem, you're in the middle of battle, and you realize we're fucked. Yeah, Kareem is going to try desperately to mentally dis to just disable the connection and pull himself back into his own body. Yeah, yeah, it ain't working. But what you guys do see is one particular soldier 
who is doing his best not to break and run. He, he can't quite bring himself to jump in the fray, but he's not, he, he's not running. He's not running away in fear. He's just kind of like frozen at the moment. Uh, the other Asomites are joining in. Battle's going. Bolts of this black and green energy are streaking across the walls, uh, climbing around the stonework. Uh, the scorpions are coming in. Uh, we start a new round. Uh, Azim, or, uh, Irvine, um, you've got that scorpion on its back, and uh, several of the soldiers have run in and are trying to stab it, and they're, they're having trouble penetrating the chitin. Um, but they're not aiming for the face for some reason. What do you do? He's going to go for the place that they are not going to. The yep. face. That's the perfect... Your knife plunges into it. You don't even have to make a roll. Just ka right in the forehead. And and it goes... Oh, and a wisp of steam or something escapes the mouth. Um, and the, the whole form splits open. And black ichor... Uh, spooges out all over the floor... And a human body within, shriveled and almost mummified, kind of slips out with it. And leaving the shell of the scorpion there, uh, now fully dead. Uh, Mehdi, um, you're up. There's a couple of uh, that are uh, soldiers engaged with you. Um, they're surrounded. There's about f they're they're trying to fend off about four attacks at the same time, and they're they're getting they're steadily getting cuts, cut on the leg, cut on the chest, cut on the neck, as they're they're trying to block and 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 defend all these attacks at the same time because most of the reinforcements just got cut off. Mm. Well, I figured after that first attack, he figures one sword, or one bladed weapon, isn't going to be enough. So he's going to try and conjure a second one for dual wielding. Excellent. Conjure away. Okay. I have to remember how to do this again. Give me a sec. Oops, what page was it? Two twenty. Past it. There it is. Okay, now, as far as sword goes, would that be more to Magic of the Smith? Given. Uh, I'd have to open up the book that has it. One more. Yeah. So I suppose we have to determine if a sword of this particular time would be composed of more than one material. Uh, yeah, at the very minimum, the handle is usually composed of either wood or bone. Okay. Yeah, so that would require magic of the smith. Uh, Alright, so level three. Alright. Now... Oh. This would require the willpower roll again. One blood. This is going to be the exact replica of the blade she's already holding. Temporary willpower. Level two. Oh, no, a sec. It was. Was it Div 3 plus the power level or Div yes, 2? Yes, Div 3 oh, plus power level. Div 3. That's what I thought. Okay, and I might actually expend a, willpower, a temporary willpower on this one. Okay. Alright. You. Mutter a few words, you look at the blade in your hand, pass your hand over it, and now you're holding two. Alright, uh, Astartes, more attacks are coming at the uh, stone statue, at your, uh, at your metal form. Yes. Um, you, are now, you have now taken two levels of unsoakable bashing damage. 
And I want to do entrancement on the side of the enemy. Okay. What's a diff? Uh, they're willpower, right? Yes. Six. Then it's going to be four for my with my specialties. Okay. Uh, one of the attacking guardsmen. Uh. Has been bash, 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 and there just kind of stops. You can't give him any instructions, but he stops what he was doing, and he goes to. Okay, you're his friend, and now he's going to go do something else. I was going for more of the nice boulder thing you had. We had going in the first time I used this power. That's a nice That's boulder. Just, yeah, distract them so that the Esomites can have an easier yeah. chance. I want to guide them to me but, and distract them at the same time so that the Asamites can fight them easier, have an easier time fighting them. Yep. About another minute goes by. You guys are, are slowly cleaning up the mess, but it becomes clear at Stardust you can't hold this forever. You're at after about the sixth point of, of, of bashing damage, you realize they're not stopping. Uh, I hope that I've given the SMX enough time to regroup. Yep, you sure have. And I'm gonna drop the form and return to the rear and prepare to engage in range combat. Right. So you, you fall back, um, Irvine. How about you? You you guys have finished cleaning up the uh, everything everything that came in. It took about thirty forty five seconds of what felt like 10 minutes of fighting to, to pack in there, but it really only took about a minute. We cannot hear anything else coming from the tunnel at this moment, yes? Oh, no, there's a lot more coming. Oh. They're, they're, they're sure. already trying to crowd in. You, this uh, Astartes getting in there slowed them down enough where you, it stopped you from being overwhelmed for a moment. We need to find a way to seal this. I actually have an idea for that. Because <laughs> Meddy probably got the idea from what Astartes did. She'll be able to make it, or he'll be able to make it permanent. Excellent. Astartes, you drop the form and you you have entranced a couple of people. So they they've are, are right there. Um, so when the form drops, they like put their backs to you for a second and give you the time you need to roll out of the way of danger and you do a backwards roll and kind of tumble um, back into the ranks of the Asimites, um giving a clear shot uh, for Mehdi to do what Mehdi is going to do. Okay. So we'll have to wait till next turn to... No, go ahead, right now. Okay. So, um... Yeah, we're not exactly in combat case... rounds. <laughs> ah, fair enough. Well, in this case, uh... Matty's going to invoke uh, level 2 conjuring permanency, but sacrifice a thumb and use the major creation ritual to create that metal boulder that he just saw. And put it in exactly the same spot where Astartes was. Sounds excellent. That's, that's right. literally just a size limitation, but it's one single material. Mm -hmm. And it's just size. Boom! Exactly. Now. I'll make that first roll first, which is the rolling of the willpower for the, the discipline itself. And then the ritual to follow. Yeah. Uh, do the ritual first, because you had, you had a few seconds to think about this, right? Um, we're going to hand wave the time requirement, because normally it would take a little longer than this, but we're going to hand wave that. And you were like, I see what he's doing. It's working great. Let me do this. Make the ritual roll first, and then your summoning roll. 
Okay. Uh, there will be no willpower roll required to bite your thumb off because this is life or fucking death. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Alright. So, intelligence, occult. Now it's a level three, so div six, right? Yes. Uh, that's a lot of successes. Um, you do a quick dance. You you see it, and, and you've timed it. And as a stardust is, is tumbling backwards, you stick your thumb in your mouth, and you go, Yuck, boo, and you bite it off. You, you throw the blood in a, in a quick circle, and you go to do your conjure. Boom. Conjure it up. Now, I reckon this... Mm, Roll of temporary willpower? At, uh, this is going to be diff 5. It's one single material, right? Yeah. So I'm going to use another willpower on this one as well, because right. we need this to work. <laughs> Alright, so roll four dice. Oh, down to four already. Okay. Yep. You guys. Three successes. Good enough. With your ritual, it goes. It kind of shivers for a second, and then there's a like a puff of air as it displaces um, what had been there, and you see arms and legs and like a face sticking out as people got caught in the conjuring area, and they're like, <coughs> as everything falls limp. Um, you can hear them on the other side beating on it, and 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 the uh, Jamal looks around. He goes, "Fall back! Fall back! Fall back to the caverns!" And everybody begins getting, you know, backing away from the area uh, to the next retreating points. While that is happening, I will heal my six points of damage. Yep, plenty of time. You guys gather. You fall back, you fall back, you fall back. Back, 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 back into the maze. And pretty soon you don't even remember, you, you don't even think you could make your way back to that spot. You hear booms and thuds, crashes, and the onslaught begins to come again, getting closer and closer. Jamal, Azim, several of the other luminaries look at each other. You can see they're preparing for a final fight. And then it gets quiet. And where there had previously been bangs and shouts of, of victory, there's a hoarse scream. And it kind of cuts off, and another, and another. And then there's a pop, pop, just a quiet little pop sound. And a trickle of blood begins to flow down the cavern floor. You guys can see it. Trickle, 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 trickle. Making its way towards you. And the trickle becomes another trickle. A third, a fourth join it. Becomes thicker and thicker. Soon it's no longer a trickle. Now it's a tiny stream. And then a larger stream. And then a flood of blood streaming down the cavern and the, now the blood contains body parts heads arms weapons less identifiable things matter it gets up to your ankles then to your knees then to your waist for a, just just a minute and you're kind of like struggling against the flow and then it begins to lower and lower and lower till the flow stops, leaving only film of blood and puddles on the ground. And you hear this little step, splash, step, splash, step, splash. And a tiny little child sized figure steps around the corner and comes up to Jamal. And you see it is burned. And it says, Do not be afraid. I am Urshogi, and I am of the blood. And that was the first introduction of Urshulgi to the rest of his clan.
so wanted to experience that scene. And then the smoke begins to fade. And the forms around you become wavering and clear. And you come to... And you thank God that you're not human. Because the humans apparently have waking up with a horrible hangover. And you come to your senses, laying on the ground. Um, Astartus, you feel sore. Uh, almost like you have taken damage. And you feel your medallion, and it feels weaker. You know you've used it. You guys stand up. Kareem is on his hands and knees, kind of like, oh, trying not to puke. Oh, God. Oh, just just like, oh. Um, and so are the others, as a matter of fact. They're, they're kind of stirring around like, water. Water, need water. Oh, so thirsty. Um, you guys stand up, and it feels like no time at all has passed. It's the same night. They look at you, Irvine, and with a, a nod and a, a finger, you are sent away to await a discussion. Astartes, you and Medi, they look at you and they say, Now you know what the sorcerers really are going to be doing. Now that you know, do you accept or decline? I take a really big breath, even though I don't need it. Exhale. I accept this new burden and duty. Without much hesitation, Medi also says, I accept. You don't remember the rest of what happens this night. But neither of you are no are any longer of his ears. Something within you is irrevocably changed. Astartes, you no longer have presence as a clan discipline. You now have uh, Asamite sorcery as a clan discipline. Uh, Medi, uh, same thing. You no longer have presence. You now have both of you have lost presence and now have sorcery. So just so I, or just so I know for sure, my clan disciplines now is going to be Auspex, Duranki, um, that's my sorcery and and Quietus. Okay. Um, Irvine, you are taken aside, and Azim thrice bless just kind of appears and walks with you down. And he says to you, Ravine, you have the instincts of a warrior, a fighter. Your first instinct was to pull your knives and blades and fight with the physical gifts that you were granted, not and not use your studies to aid those around you or increase your fighting prowess. You are a warrior, and you should be proud of it. I sense that there is more behind your words, that there is a but in there. He just shakes his head, he says, there is no but. <laughs> what is expected of me? Is it expected something else? He, Do not fight that alongside my brothers. They wished you, for several reasons, they inflicted this vision upon you. They wished you to know the true enemy and what it is the sorcerers truly need to be doing. But secondly, to judge your suitability, they wanted to see your reaction. Would you use your magic first, second, or third? Instead, you elected to use the gifts of Hakim, your speed, the powers innately granted to you to strip 
strength and stamina. You in your time of need, you fell you fell back on the gift of Hakim, not upon sorcery. Yes. For a, while I strained by Oshogi, I am still a child of Hakim, not of Oshogi. He nods. He nods. You understand. Be at peace. And he guides you away from the ritual chambers and walks away. And that's where we're going to end tonight, unless you guys have something urgent that you need to do. I just want to inquire about my new... Do I acquire the sorcerer weakness or do, do I lose my vizier weakness? It, you lose the vizier weakness and you acquire the sorcerer weakness. Um, um, uh, just to be uh, clear on the points, um, is that um, the... Um, uh, is that going to be a part two or is this... There um, is not or... going to be a part two. Okay, so um, I want to see if anyone figured out what Kareem was. Besides um, a spy. Besides a spy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking here, it gets a little bit far-fetched, but... I think it's something related to the body or something. But I find it very hard for the body to infiltrate Alamut. He is not a Bali. Or anything... No, no, anything to... he's not a Bali. He's a Jin. Stop there. He's a Jin. <laughs> he's a Jin. No. Okay, no. <laughs> one, okay, you got to a question there. <laughs> well, the one thing I, I did figure out was um, the power that you were using um, before, because uh, my one-shot character had that. It was... Um, oh, the skin of the chameleon or something? Chameleon skin? No. No? Nope. Sort of closer. In a sense, closer. Okay. I I'm going to tell you guys this right now. If I was in your shoes, I would have no fucking idea. <laughs> so. Oh. No, I definitely have no idea. <laughs> no idea. I know he cannot be trusted, but that's, that's the extent of it. I mean, I'll put it this way. I would know, but I wouldn't know the specifics. So I'd, I'd, I'd be able to have a general guess, but that that's pretty much it. Mm. So... Yeah, am I am I allowed to say? Or yeah, I? no, absolutely. We're the Kareem is most likely never going to be seen again. And yeah. plus, if he ever is, I trust these guys not to meta game. So yeah, um, Kareem is a mage. Oh, a, a true mage. Um, he he infiltrated. He managed to infiltrate Alamut. Um, because he was looking for info on. Ala Shrad and what the hell was going on there because Ala Shrad used to be what it was a mortal mage. He still yeah. is a mortal mage at this yeah. point. Yeah. And uh his disappear caused quite a stir. And so Karim was assigned to basically try and go fact finding. Hence why he got particularly interested um when he heard who a status had been summoned by and why he listened at the door. Um, he's specifically part of the group that, I'm not sure if they'd be called it at this point, but they will be called the al Ibatin. They actually are at this point called that, uh, mm -hmm. for about the last 200 years. Mm. Um, cool. Yeah, and I specifically brought this up because I remember Chris uh, brought up the idea of a mage, um, a mage infiltrating Alamut, and I was like, I have the perf I have the perfect mage faction for you here. I loved it. I loved the idea. I loved everything about it. And I was like, you know, hey, here's the deal. You've you've infiltrated. You've been in Alamut for like three weeks. Um, but because of your powers, everyone thinks you've been there for like two or three years. And you're just a ghoul that's like a general gopher. 
go do this for me, go do that for me. And that's how he has established his cover. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Oh, go on. Um, I only used uh, two spells. I managed to go only casting twice, I think, uh, throughout the whole thing. Um, once to escape, um, um, or not escape, but um, to when uh, when I botched that stealth roll uh, to sink into the shadows. Yeah, that and... that power essentially allows him to blend in with any anything. So yeah, it, it, if you read it on the website, it, it says blend into any crowd, any passerby. Everyone just sort of accepts that he belongs there. Uh, and the um, other power I used, which ended up being a bit of a mixed a mixed uh, bless, blessing, was to. Uh, sk- use a status as a scry focus during that ritual um part of which probably didn't help when i got pulled into the fucking dream hallucination thing yeah and he and he took the flaw addiction to uh psycho psychosomatic drugs or the the yeah. basically it was like hallucinogenic <laughs> drugs and i was because that's a standard thing that mages did back then that that was like a standard practice was to dose themselves with these hallucinogenic drugs to get their powers going. Um, and I was like, oh, this is this is freaking perfect. It's perfect. I gotta do this. Yeah. Um, I had, a, I gotta say, I had a lot of fun playing that. I did too. Uh, you guys all get two experience points for your main characters tonight. Um, it, was, it was a lot of fun, actually. Yeah, I, I I enjoyed this. I thought I thought it was a great, um, great little session, and um, uh, I love these little one shots when they go over well, because <laughs> it gives you time to, to do stuff you don't normally do. Also, gives a bit of this uh, is my first time playing as a knight and getting a view on the inner clan stuff. Yeah. So, also gave me a bit more perspective on them, so that was nice. Yeah. Yeah, as long as yeah, it doesn't end up with a, with a total party kill, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, uh, like Halloween. The previous time, if I recall correctly. Yeah. <laughs> that was the Halloween session, man. Come on. Uh, that was just an unlucky session, that one. Yeah, that was but, horribly um, unlucky. Lots, lots of bad dice rolls yeah. there. Anyway. Yeah. Anyways, guys, uh, I have to go. Um, see you in a couple of weeks. Uh, bye. Right, bye. Right. See you soon. Bye. 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 All right, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for uh, coming tonight and listening to us. I do hope that you uh, enjoyed enjoyed it, and you know you can tune back in. Right. I want you guys all to have a great evening. <laughs>